Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's power and Wi Fi and all that stuff. Uh, for the record, Jeff Bannon, Vermont NEA. Thank you for having me here to discuss with you uh, H H71. Um, in large measure, I served on the uh, school construction passengers. It was, it was a, an enjoyable moment, uh, time. But anyway, so this bill largely covers a lot of that waterfront and does a nice job of um, capturing that. The only addition I think here that I have uh, any substance is the working group, the legislative school construction work group on page 11. Um, it lists some entities uh, that uh, the working group shall uh, interact with and, and uh, consult with. And it's missing, but I think it's, it's a key component here, which is the educated voice. Uh, people who actually live in a building day in, day out. A friend of mine is a planner. And he was talking about planning a prison. It took him seven years to plan the prison. And he was working with uh, his young uh, planner. And uh, he worked with a uh, more seasoned planner who said, uh, don't worry about all this. You'll be working on this project for seven years, but people inside will be in there for life and trying to figure out how to get out. <laughs> so we'll make something and it'll, it'll be botched in some way. Uh, and don't worry about that. You know, do the best you can to the information you have right now. I'm not suggesting that it's that it's, it's comparable, but we are talking about a building that uh, teachers, support staff, bus drivers, cashier workers will be working for years and years and years. Um, and it would be good to have their voice. So, for example, when we have our fall district meetings around the state, I sat next to a gentleman who I think was in Woodstock, because they're doing a, a big bottom, you know, pastor, um, kind of like he did. Um, but he, the architects met with the school staff, I think he said three or four times. And one of the um, suggestions the school staff made was uh, you have the cafeteria excuse me, the, the school guidance office dumping out right into the cafeteria. Well, we're often dealing with kids who are in crisis in a difficult moment and may come out of our office not looking their the very best. Mm -hmm. And you're sending them right into a cafeteria situation, which you might not be good. And all they did was make some simple changes to how the, uh, the guidance office was exited or something, I guess. I don't know all the details. But the teachers really appreciated that, that they actually thought, what's where is this kid going to go leaving the guidance office? And how are they going to be met by their peers? And if it's dumping right into a cafeteria, they might um, not want to interact right, right, right away with the peers. Uh, and so it's those little things that, that make uh, a school function and function well for students, for staff, and others to interact with them. So my only suggestion would be to ask the, the working group to consult with uh, us and we'll appoint a teacher or something, I guess, you know, because it lists all the, the entities, school boards, superintendents. <clears throat> I think we should have a voice in our children. Thanks for that input. That's really great. Do you know if that omission was by design or? I don't know. I missed it in the first round. Yeah. I apologize. Okay. I should have caught it over in the house. And I, I'm, you know, there are two teachers, uh, at least three uh, on that house ed committee. And I'm sure they would yeah, I'm consider that why. I missed it. So it's, it's on me and I'm here to say it's a modest ask. Yeah. But it, it seems to us to make a lot of sense. Okay. We can ask. Um, some of the house members do, but why they brought that up. Right. I I, I want to engage with a uh, person of common yesterday. He was, uh, everybody's trying to get out of here for a little Yeah. Bar. Yeah. Myself included. Okay. So that's it. That's my only suggestion to Phil. We think it should pass. Thank you. Thanks. Am I starting again? Yes. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah, for the worker, to, to summarize, uh, we think it's good to have an educated voice to, for the working group, the legislative working group, to consult with not just school boards and superintendents, but an educator. Somebody who works in the building day in, day out for years and years and years. Great. And Colin's testimony was great yesterday and very helpful. On um, both news. Very helpful. Yes. Yeah, he's pretty good. Yeah, he's, he knows the stuff. Yeah. At least on that issue. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Try safely. Yeah. Thanks, you too. Sorry to keep you. Huh? You're pumping. All good. Got a cup of coffee. It was, yeah, it was, not, was not happening at all. <laughs> Mr. Nichols. Oh. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. 
Uh, so for the record, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. Um, I'm just going to start off where Jeff left off, and then I'll share a few thoughts with you. So we're not named in that group either, um, and I was okay with that. The reason being is this is about the master plan facility. So this is the state level type stuff. So principals and teachers, when a, a school decides to do a project, are going to be very involved in that, and they should be. But for the master plan about um, how the funding is going to work and all those things, I don't think it necessarily needs to have members of our associations there. So that's the reason why I haven't said anything about that same thing that Jeff just brought up. And we could talk about that more if you'd like to. Uh, so we fully support the bill. We realize that health education spent a lot of time on it, worked hard to get a lot of the details right. As you know, it's been quite a while since 2007, since we've had funding for school construction. Uh, and as a result, one at least one prominent national study I read showed that Vermont was the second worst uh, in the nation in terms of the quality of our facilities. I don't know who the worst was. I can't remember. It was a few months ago when I read that. Um, our school representative, I mean, our school construction aid task force representative was uh, Chris Young, who's the principal at North Country Union High School, who, as you know, has been dealing with a lot of PCB type issues there. Uh, and they're a big, one of the bigger high schools in the state and the only real big high school in that area. He would be glad to come in and testify at some point if you if you folks would like him to. Um, we fully support the intent behind the bill. Obviously, we're waiting for the delivery of the findings in the form of proposed recommendations. And then we'll, I'm sure we'll have some testimony on that. And just a couple of points we want to hit on that we think are relevant. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the working group, we were talking about BOCES, the working group here is going to have a difficult task. And they're going to have to make some tough decisions as to what their recommendations are. And then those recommendations are going to come to the General Assembly. And you folks are going to have to make some tough decisions. It seems from the conversations that I heard in House Ed that all the experts have testified um, have been clear that spending money on buildings that have lost their usefulness is not good policy. So when buildings are at a certain point, we really we reach the point of diminishing returns. In those cases, we're probably better off going new and also looking to see if there's appropriate consolidation that can happen. And I think that's especially true at the middle and high school level. Um, also in this process, uh, we need to take care of any buildings that have PCBs or other environmental hazards. I know that's mentioned in the bill. We want to make sure that all of our students are in safe buildings, and we need to recognize that local taxpayers may not have the capacity to make the necessary changes without appropriate level of state financial and technical assistance. I want to say that I love the intent language that focuses on setting clear parameters for the agency of education and making clear the intent of the work um, of the working group is really spelled out. Representative Conlon spoke to that yesterday, and you folks asked some good questions around that. Around that, so keeping that intent strong is important. We also like the ongoing payment plan concept, using Vermont's bond capacity to leverage funds and for the state to pay a percentage annually. Uh, seems like a reasonable solution. That's my understanding of, of how the great work Rhode Island's done on fixing so many other school buildings over the last few years. That's how they've been able to do that. We need to start where we are, prioritize and start moving forward. And it may take us, you know, a couple of decades before we get all the way there. And then finally, and I'm just going to read from my notes here. So I say this correctly. Um, all Vermont children are all Vermont children. We should not look at our children as children of a certain community, but rather as a child of the community we call Vermont. So we have a statewide funding system in large part because our constitution calls for educating of all of our children in an equitable manner. And we tried to do that financially. As we look at the school system's physical infrastructure, we should look at building infrastructure as a critical component of a high quality education in today's world. And as a state, we should take collective responsibility for this work. Now, yesterday, uh, Senator Weeks made a comment about 21st century, and I can give you some stuff on that. But basically what we're talking about, Senator Weeks, is students that uh, can communicate, that are critical thinkers, that are problem solvers, that are just not kids who necessarily remember something by rote memorization and can throw it back up on an exam, but actually can work well with others uh, and then have skills like showing up to work on time, uh, <clears throat> being responsible team members, working well with others. Those are what employers are telling us over and over again that they want to see, whether it's from college graduates or kids moving from high school into technical center programs or uh, certificate programs 
or going straight into the job force, including the military. We hear over and over again, we want problem solvers, self-initiative, people that can work well with others. And those are the 21st century skills that we are mostly talking about in education. Mr. 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 How does that differ from 20th century skills? <laughs> well, in the, in the, in the model of the 21st century was more of an industrial, 20th century is a more of an industrial model. And so we were creating kids for, for jobs that already existed that we knew. How can you be a good assembly line worker? And it, it was very common for people to only have one or two functions that they had to do. That workforce is completely gone now. Even in the major car manufacturers, you don't sit there and take the fender and put it in this spot over and over again. Instead, you're helping problem solve, you're working in teams, and you're collaborating. So interpersonal intelligence is a much higher uh, need in almost all jobs today than it was you know, 30 or 40 years ago, as are technical skills. So schools have to try to provide both of those. And yesterday, you folks talked about, in the BOCES bill, and I know we need a better name for that, talked about online uh, ongoing training of people. That's true in the workforce now, more so than it ever was before. Companies that used to hire people that would sell trucks and stuff now are sending them to trainings to make sure they really understand how the trucks work. And I know because my son sells trucks, sells tractor trailer trucks, and they go to trainings all the time to really have a better understanding of the product and what the product can do. Didn't used to be that way. So it's it's in every field. I grew up on a family farm. Uh, my dad used to go down the down the major, and he would say, "This cow's a pretty good milker. I'll give her two scoops." This cow has a pain in the butt. She's going to get only one. And, you know, today there's computers that say this is how much you should feed this cow because of the amount of milk that she produces for her body weight and those types of things. So it's a much more complex, dynamic uh, workforce, Senator, than it, than it was in the industrial age. And so schools have been slow to move in that direction, and we need to continue to move further in that direction. Yeah, no, I agree. I was just... Uh just sort of teasing in a way, because what you described could have been also 20th century, you know, uh, educational uh, goals. And I think what we need to just decide, we need to decide as a committee, are, are we going to pull this apart? I mean, I could see it also becoming messy. In other words, you bring something like that to the floor, and these are the, the goals that the education committee uh, believes are 21st century goals. Next thing you end up with, you know, 30 amendments plus that, oh, I'm sad that. So I just think it, it's the one area that, I, that I've that i noticed that we just have to have a little conversation about. Um, For what yeah. it's worth, I would, not, I would not break it up. I would leave it pretty much alone, let that committee come back with recommendations, and then let policy lead function after yeah. that. Yeah. Personally. Because I yeah. think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great point. Anything else, Mr. Nichols? No, that's it. Subject to any questions you folks might have. The only question I have at this point is, and I guess it's for Mr. Fannin as well, my gut this seems like it's in pretty good shape. A few little changes here and there. Uh, who else do you think we should hear from? Oh. That you think would be particularly helpful as we make our way through this uh, Have you heard from uh, Jill Briggs, Jill Briggs uh, Campbell. Campbell yet? Not yet. So we will have you her. In. Definitely okay. hear from her. Yeah. And you should also hear from the person the AOE hired who's been testifying on this. And yesterday, I couldn't think of his name, but I came up with it. Now I can't think of it. Bob Donahue. Um, yes. Um, who's, I don't know him personally, but he's very good. Great. Both of them can talk to you about the process, what they learned from Rhode Island and also Massachusetts and why they've gone down this road. And they've done, I think they've done incredible work. Um, the AOE has been phenomenal on those two people particularly. Great. Shen, or, Shen, can you think of particular teachers, principals, anybody that we need to hear from that might need to weigh in on this, at, you know, sort of in your sort of professional circles? Or are, are we going to be okay, do you think? From our perspective, you're okay, although Chris Young would be more than willing to, to talk to you, but he, he was very involved in the task force. Chris Young uh, also won an award recently, so shout out to, to Mr. Young. For the United States, he's the National Association of Secondary School Principals Advocacy Champion for the whole country. Truly really great. Very proud about that, yeah. 
Jack? The only um, thought I have, and Jay, you may have a better idea about this too, but somebody's gone through a recent school construction large project to give uh, you all in the committee here uh, a sense of how that works. And I don't know who that is, Jay. Um, it could be Burlington. Could be Burlington. You're right. I, yeah, but that, some, no, no, like, yeah. Maybe somebody else, you know, that, that hasn't been somebody in addition to Burlington. I yeah, I like the Burlington idea. That's the biggest project that we've had for a while. If if Tom Flanagan or somebody from there wanted to talk yeah. a little bit about what that process was like, that might be really good. And I think you have a senator there that has some connections there as well. Right. No, I, I mean, I, I get that from Burlington's perspective. Somebody's been through it and gone. Yeah. You're you're in the middle of it. Bro. Yeah, I think right. somebody who can look backwards and say, oh, yeah, here's what I learned. There hasn't been a school built in like, what, 30 I know. years. I, I, I think Springfield PTE. Isn't that a yeah. relatively new construction? Mount Anthony Union Middle School might have been the last. Is it possible the last building that went up in 2000? When new it's a long time. Renovation. Winooski. Yeah. Right. So Winooski. Yeah. Yeah. Winooski did a great project, and Gene Berthium would be glad to come talk to you. He's our high school principal of the year uh, for this upcoming year. Um, he was there for that whole project, the planning of it, and the actual completion of it, and is now the principal in that building still. So he, he would be a, a person you might want to talk to. Great. Anything else, maybe? Please. Just a different, different perspective. So we're, we were looking at, you know, who to add. I'm wondering, just looking at the list, the justification for the Agency of Natural Resources, Natural Resources Board, and the Department of Agricultural Rural Development. I'm just curious why those organizations are embedded. Uh, if we could just maybe get a little logic from Representative Conlon. Yeah. You no, know, just, yeah. just say, okay, look, yep, yeah, get it. Yeah, All good. And then, yeah, happy to have Rep. Conlon back in to talk a little bit about that. There must have been a reason, mm -hmm. and he may have even mentioned it yesterday briefly, but I don't good. know if he did. Um, I don't remember asking about it. So yeah, we can have Representative Conlon back in. Did we hear? Did we hear from them on the? Uh, when we're on the school construction task force. Hear from, from these a, folks? A, um, yeah, those groups that Senator Weeks was talking about. I don't. Not know. Department of Ag or Rural Development, although they did come up because they've got funding available, and that's Winooski uh, got money from them. Okay. So that's why they're there. I'm sure of that. Um, no, I don't think we did hear from all of these folks. I, I don't. Re I read through it and I was like, no. some of these didn't resonate with me. I was trying to think back to we hear from them on mm -hmm. the task force. Okay. So, so reaching back to the school construction task force, the the bond banks involvement was quite insightful. Yes, and they may be helpful in keeping us kind of fiscally steered. You know that type of perspective, mm -hmm. not just hey, what do we want to do, but hey, how do we do it? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we fund it? It's going to be huge. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You were both on it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And. Mr. Fanning, you said the NEA isn't on it. This the um the the working group, the, the legislative school A is supposed to uh consult with certain groups. Yeah. I, I understand what Jay is saying, but I do think it's important to have an educator voice. Yeah. When on the on, on the legislative folks who are trying to figure out how to fund this, not for necessarily saying this is how you should fund it, but here's how this does work in a school setting. And somebody who's working there in the schools for 30 years, why you want this or don't want that. And then I guess the other thing I would put out there to the committee, as well as to our two witnesses, um, Susanna Davis's group, uh, in terms of bringing a perspective of diversity. And then uh, we talked about. Um, the disability community. Um, I know Senator Hashim has been working hard with the um, deaf and hard of hearing community. Should be thinking oh, yeah. about uh, DVAS, D V A S, I believe is the acronym. And that stands for. Uh, I don't want to mess it up a lot. Sure. 
except for modern advocacy services. Okay. And I'm not, it would be great to have them testify. I don't know if they're the right ones to be on the committee, but I think some representative of the disability community at large, it would probably, I think it would be really neat to have someone. Rachel Seelig from yeah. Dale? No, no, with um, so legal aid. Legal aid, yes. Could have Dale on there. Disabilities, aging, and independent living. It, when I think of that, I think of people over sixty-five, but I could be wrong. Uh, Dale yeah. is covered. Yeah, covered. Yeah, guardianship. Everything. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah, at the top of their page, deaf, hard of hearing, deaf plus, deaf disabled. Late death and population is part of their service. Okay. Yeah. Just to kind of not put the 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 actual working group into box, just to say something to the effect of the working group shall consult with the following shall consult with the following entities, like some some of the not but not limited to, you know, the following entities. Just, Give them, give them. Doesn't it say that? It does say that. Go yeah, J. Any other group they think relevant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and then what we can, I think what we need to figure out as a committee, in addition to the uh, educator on the committee, uh, I think it would be, we just have to decide whether or not we want somebody representing the disability community, the diversity community. Um, or are those being consulted with? That's something we can, members of the centers, think about. Yeah, Mr. Matt. One last thought is, yeah. um, of a name is Rob Evans. Rob Evans is, um, I don't know what his official title is, but he's uh, school safety. He consults, he's a consultant Good. to the AOE. Yeah. Um, and and when there were a lot, there were, there, there was a lot of money to, to quote unquote harm schools. And, and the, it made sense. You'd, want, you'd build a door that was bulletproof and et cetera. But the yeah. wall around it was crumbling. Yeah. And so Rob is, is a, a former state trooper, um, comes out and with the lens of looking at, at physically how do we make schools safe. Mm -hmm. And I certainly might have some wisdom because he's been steeped in this stuff for years, working with the Secret Service and other aid, federal agencies. And who is he with now? Do you know? He's with um, Margolis, and Margolis is a consulting firm okay. that, that has a contract with the AOE to do work on behalf of schools for school safety generally. Would you yeah, mind? He, he's an advisor for Mar Margolis Healy, and he's the director of the Vermont School Safety Center. I bet you that. Uh, that would be great. And we did talk to the Vermont School Safety Center last year when we were working on the school safety bill. We may have met Rob. Um, and I just didn't recall, but if you wouldn't mind emailing that name to Morgan, that would be terrific. Yeah. Because I'd love to move this uh, toward the end of next week. And I think we're in pretty good shape to do so. Um, and I don't see any big conflict with the house. Anybody else that he wants to? Okay. Great. Okay, thank you both. Okay, Morgan, would you mind seeing if Mr. Burns can come a little early? And we'll I will check on that. Thanks. Welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, we are shifting gears now to go back to H73, an act relating to financing the testing for remediation, the presence of PCBs in schools. This is the uh, bill that we're working from. Uh, there is the house came in, talked us, talked talk through it with us. So did Mr. O'Grady, um, and we're eager to hear your thoughts on it. So, um, do you know everybody yeah. here? Yes, you yes. do. Okay, uh, it's a pleasure to be here first time, I guess, this year um, in your committee. But for the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPIRG. Uh, BPERG has um, a long history. We've been around for 52 years. And for much of that time, we, we, we've often been in front of different committees of the legislature to address issues related to uh, chemicals and chemicals effect uh, on human health. Uh, that is one of the many issues that we work on, but we've done a lot of work in that area, not so often in front of this committee uh, on that topic, but occasionally. Um, and 
uh, health and welfare usually. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, it's the natural resources, you know, right. but, um, but it is worth pointing out that uh, whenever we consider chemicals and their potential effect on human health, we often look first to those populations that are most acutely um, affected. Uh, and uh, there's an exquisite risk that comes with small children, for instance, uh, pregnant women, um, uh, people with uh, uh, immune systems that are compromised for one reason or another. And, um, and so we take special interest in settings where children congregate for long periods of time, child care centers or schools uh, being you know, top of the list there. Uh, so I say that by way of introduction to myself and to BPIRG. Just personally, I guess I would also say I, I'm a parent of a 12-year-old in the local school here in Montpelier. Um, and, and so I have a, you know, a keen interest in the quality of the schools. Um, that means the quality of the education and the, uh, the schools themselves and the infrastructure issues and have been one of those parents quite engaged in some of these issues. And we were working on lead in, in school drinking water a few years back. You know, we, we were uh, happily participating in that process with our school officials who, who were terrific uh, in that. But, uh, uh, but obviously, I, I have a concern about uh, the idea that there could be chemicals of any sort in a, in a school setting that could endanger my child or anybody's child, in addition to the folks who work day to day, year after year in that school setting uh, as well. So the teachers and custodial staff and other staff as well. Um, I'm also aware that uh, my neighbors in Montpelier saw fit to, uh, to vote down the school budget uh, on town meeting day. I, well, I know, as you all do, of the fiscal challenges um, that schools and our communities and individuals face right now. So none of the issues surrounding this topic are easy. I, I grant that from the start. Um, but I guess I'm, I am here, uh, I think, to say the quiet part out loud, which is the, the bill before you um, is not before you because there has been any change in what we know about the threat that PCBs pose to human health or children's health in particular. There is no new science that I am aware of, and I don't think that the legislators and the other body heard that either. I mean, I, I would welcome it if we somehow just realized that the hundreds of studies that show that PCBs pose a real threat uh, to human beings um, were somehow flawed. Uh, and we now know the truth and they're not a problem. And so let's, let's back away from uh, testing. Uh, I know this doesn't put an immediate pause or stop to all testing. I understand the functions of the bill that is before you, but it does entertain the possibility of a, of a stoppage in that testing, and therefore the stoppage of work to identify real problems and potentially take actions to remediate those problems. And therefore, what it really means is we are entertaining the possibility that for lack of funds or lack of identification of a, a source of funding for this purpose, we will allow, intentionally allow the continued exposure, you know, kids in school to, to PCBs, because that's the result, that is the natural result of this legislation if it is passed into law. As I say, it's the quiet part out loud. I, I, I know there are all sorts of problems of finding the funding and but that's the work that has to be done. I think it's appropriate for the administration to identify some possible funding sources, and then you all, you, you, there, are, there are roles that you all have to play in this. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me that the challenge of insufficient funding justifies <laughs> uh, moving away from a process of identifying the threats that may be there. And I'm Point out the possibility. I've heard some say, you know, the worst possible thing would be to do the tests, find that there are PCBs in a school, and then not have state funding available to assist that school to do the cleanup. That's bad. I understand that. I don't think that's the worst outcome, though. I I can imagine a situation where testing is done, and 
a PCB problem is found in a school, but perhaps uh, not of the scale of Burlington, but um, more concentrated in a classroom or a, a section of the school or a custodian's closet or something where one could make sure that people are not in that area, uh, at least regularly, day after day. And you could protect students, staff, teachers um, at that school without necessitating the entire school to be shut down and, and uh, you know, the, the very drastic remediation that is, you know, necessary in some cases. I think that's, um, it's better to know, to be able to take some action. And it is possible that, you know, uh, just giving parents uh, that information, you know, would allow them to take uh, some steps. But I, I really think I support because Bieber supports the legislation as initially passed because I think there was justification for it. We support the idea that the state should come up with funds to assist those schools in taking action where it is necessary and obviously to, to do the testing itself. And we see no no reasonable, no compelling justification that moves us away from that to say that um, we should now entertain the possibility of stopping that program um, because it doesn't make anybody safer taking that action, and it could unnecessarily prolong exposure that could uh, result in significant health effects. I think you all know what these health effects are. I mean, I got, I'll share you with written testimony, but I, I don't think that's probably what you need right now, but it includes cancer. It is reproductive and developmental disorders. It, um, a, a range of not insignificant health effects, including, again, to pregnant women who uh, uh, it's not unusual for pregnant women to be working in schools um, as well. So that's a particular kind of exposure that you want to limit if there's any way possible. So that's why I'm here. It is just to represent that public health concern and interest and to say, unless you found a reason that makes us less concerned about that, then I want to encourage you to do whatever you can to find the way to allow this program, not whether this program was for, but how it was for. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, 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 so it's yeah, written yeah. soon, but yeah. But yeah and I also so will share, uh, I don't know if people saw it in the news, this thing about Ho Hall, I guess University of North Carolina has shut down. So, well, I'll let everybody read it. It's a very serious I, I saw a very serious situation, situation. and it's a lengthy piece. I, I would encourage the members of the committee to, to look that up. Yeah. Uh, Senator Kewa, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your testimony. Um, so I have a lot of thoughts, a lot of things to say. Uh, I'll start with, um, I, I obviously don't argue with the science at all. I mean, I can't, I'm not a scientist. Um, so I won't do that. Um, but one thing I have learned being on the Health and Welfare Committee is that we are poisoned in almost every way you can imagine, from the clothing we have on to the feminine hygiene products we use to the makeup we put on to the things that we eat. We all have PCBs in our body. That was one of the first things Dr. Levine told me when we were going through the Burlington um, situation. So um, so I, I struggle with, you know, I don't want to say that hypocrisy, but it sometimes seems disingenuous that we're focusing solely on schools when, uh, and I know we are trying to pass legislation that we, you know, limit PFAS and things like that, but this is a huge problem. And for me, our North Star should be absolute toxin-free schools, clean schools, clean schools with windows, schools with clean air. I mean, the whole nine yards, that's, we got to get there, right? Um, in the meantime, this is like a really complicated situation, very complicated. And I say complicated because, yes, PCBs poison us, as do lots of other chemicals. Um, but especially like in Burlington, for example, when we dug into this initially and we were looking at the exposure levels, you know, 300, what was it? 320 days a year, 12 hours a day, seven days a week exposure for a one in a million chance of getting cancer. It was, it just wasn't accurate for the population that we had in those buildings. 
Um, and we had high exposure in the tech center, but the high school exposure, I mean, sorry, we had high PCP levels in the tech center, but in the high school itself, the levels were much lower. So there's that complexity, right? There's also the complexity that we learned being on the task force, the school construction task force, that um, when you test for PCBs in the air, they vary from not just hour to hour, but it could be minute to minute. I mean, it's, it seems like it's an extremely complex testing program. Um, and so with all of that, um, and I want to ask you, because I've sat through, if not hundreds, many, many, many hours of testimony from superintendents who are grappling with this issue. But I want to hear from you as to whether or not you've heard from them. Um, and if you have, how much? And I also just want you to think a little bit about the toll on a community, on kids, on teachers, on employees, um, when a school closes or when it's compromised. Money aside, what are the other factors involved? Uh, I understand health, physical health is extremely important, but there are all these other things involved, um, emotional health. In Burlington, it was, you know, we've got 50% of our kids plus that are free and reduced lunch kids. They live in very, some of them, frankly, in dangerous, unhealthy environments. So when we were sending them home for months at a time, frankly, I'm more concerned with their well-being there than I was in school. So this is complicated and um, I, Anyway, I'll leave. I'll let you speak to everything I just said. But with that is challenging. You, you're right. These are complicated issues, and there are many factors involved. Um, I think that PCBs are are now at this point one of the most studied of the toxic chemicals that we have knowledge about and, and be concerned over. Uh, I believe Dr. Levine has in the past been in this chair and, and talking about these issues here, and he's far uh, better qualified than I am uh, to talk about this. When I last heard him speaking about it, 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 it was for me uh, compelling. Um, and that is, sometimes there, it is enough. Uh, we do have enough information to say that this is one that we should really take seriously. This is one we really should avoid, at least. Um, and, and I'm not one to say exactly what, how many parts per million is the appropriate standard, et cetera. But, but we have experts. I mean, I would like to say that Dr. Levine and the folks at A&R you know, have a responsibility to say, what is a safe level? Recognizing the challenges of testing that you have identified, and I'm not disputing that. It is a real challenge here, and it does vary in temperature. Really all sorts of things can affect that. But there are ways, I mean, we gotta do the best we can there. And I think, again, um, we're concerned not even about PCBs as the only chemical in your body. Uh, as you pointed out, you're exposed to many different things. You have many different chemicals in your body. And there's oftentimes the synergistic effect, the additive effect of chemical after chemical that can sometimes compromise an immune system that could allow you to be more susceptible to the danger of threat posed by another chemical. I simply think, uh, from what I know, PCBs are in that class of chemicals where um, action is warranted once you pass a certain threshold. And over months, threshold is different than the federal government's threshold. I, I, I'm not suggesting, you know, I'm not the best expert in the world to tell you, here's the number, you know, and, and that, but I, it, to the extent that we move toward a, a situation where we think that the solution is to pause in testing at all. I'd rather find, like, like let's get the best people to agree on the number, um, the best pathway to remediate, um, which is not always tearing a school down, you know? Uh, how can we deal with this situation most effectively? But, but I think knowledge is power in this situation. To your point, you know, school, children home from schools, I honestly think that we have learned more about COVID, you know, just since the initial days. and. Um, I am not uh, suggesting that it was inappropriate to uh, to move out of this building and other workplaces and things like that. But I think the more we learn about children, you know, um, it, it may be, um, you might handle it differently now. Um, and because there you are kind of weighing certain threats to children and for not being in school for long periods of time and that there are real threats there. 
which is again not to say that COVID isn't a real threat, but how what is the threat to children and so forth? And I I, I don't want to get make this a COVID conversation, but I'm saying let's let science help dictate the response. I appreciate your your comments for sure. Um, another thing I've witnessed, just to give you another. I wish you would listen to or been able to hear from the superintendents, but another issue that I've seen, um, we know that obesity is, a, is an issue for kids, very important health crisis, I would say. Um, in one of our schools, which has um, the gym, I think was like a couple parts per billion over the threshold, which I believe was 20 parts per billion. I could be wrong if anyone's listening um, for preschool kids. What happened was the first grade parents found out about this 20 parts per billion and we were over like we were 22. Suddenly they didn't want their kids going to gym class. So their kids weren't able to exercise. Mm -hmm. They were sitting in the main office with the, sec with the administrative assistant. Um, I don't know, I, I just, for me, that's just wrong on so many levels. First of all, they weren't even in that age category, but you, you also create this kind of panic in the community where people are making ill-informed decisions based on this fear. Um, so anyway, I'm the just analogy, I'm I saying think, another issue. You don't mean to interrupt? No, 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 go ahead. I, you know, we, we uh, organizationally are generally going to come down to the idea that um, knowledge, you know, allowing parents, allowing the members of the public to have as much information as we can gather is still the right approach. Part of that has to try to be uh, what's what does the science really best tell us, you know, in this case, and and you will run into challenges with that where people either misinterpret or or just react in a way as though if my child doesn't go to gym class and everything is hundred percent, you know, that that's that's perfect. And, you know, that's life has risks. Uh, we understand that, <laughs> and I I simply think as you. Your other committee were looking at PFAS exposure and other chemicals and daily products. That makes it just makes sense to try to limit exposure where we can to take a precautionary approach when we have enough data, enough information to lead us to think this is a real threat. Um, so let's take that precautionary approach uh, when we can. And that has to start with, with data, with information, and in this case, I think testing um, in schools. else for Mr. Burns or anything else, Mr. Burns? No, I just thank you for the opportunity. I'm, it, I'm not here to really challenge the concerns that are brought by any other party. There are lots of interested stakeholders here, and I think those are all legitimate positions. I, I just, at the end of the day, I think unless you are learning something about how the risk or threat has changed, and I don't think you're hearing that, um, then I, 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 I encourage you to stay, stay the course. Um, and to the extent that you've got to deviate from the course, look at, um, not a pause indefinitely, but something like that pause for X period of time where you're going to require the administration to come back with what's the plan, you know, how are we going to do this instead of just, well, we're not going to do it until money becomes available through some sort of magical means. I, I, I just want to encourage your, uh, and I know you will be purposeful, thoughtful uh, about this, and um, I, I just appreciate the opportunity to share those thoughts. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Um, I mean, and I will give this, we're going to hear from, I don't know who we're going to hear, a colleague of ours sent this around. This is a situation in North Carolina. We reached out to Ryan Quinn, but he doesn't feel as a journalist he should come, but we'll, we can just set this aside as your um, evening reading. We are waiting to hear from Representative Brady, who is going to uh, hopefully zoom in. She has understandably left for the day. Uh, so let's take five minutes. Welcome back everyone to Senate Education. Uh, we we're looking at H-874, uh, which passed the House only yesterday. Uh, given our time constraints, I wanted to go through this so we can look at it, even though it's not been combined by 
the editors, uh, we're looking first at H874, the first 17 pages. If you would take us through it, please. Great, Bass St. James Office of Legislative Council. Thank you for setting that up. So I just, on my screen, I have both documents side by side. Um, and so I'm going to do my best to walk through the section as introduced and pivot to the amendment, the uh, House Appropriations Committee's amendment. We have three and, amendments. Yes, that amendments. last one is uh, just one real instance of amendment. Okay, right, okay. But I'll do my best to weave it in, but if I miss something and you're confused, please no, stop me. Please. So um, section one of this bill is um, an amendment to Section 945 in Title 16, which is currently titled the Adult Diploma Program General Education Development Program uh, Statute. It is part of the Flexible Pathways chapter. This amendment, Section 1, does a couple things. So there's two parts to this program. Subsection A is the Adult Diploma Program, where a, uh, a uh, Participant in the program would get a high school diploma, and subsection B is a GED program. So those are two separate programs falling under the umbrella of what is now titled Adult Education and Secondary Credential Program. So the first thing this section does is it changes in subsection A, the eligibility age threshold. It takes it from 20 down to 16. It adds some clarifying language that someone is only eligible for the adult diploma program and the same language is added to the GED section. If they have not received a high school diploma already, they are not currently enrolled in a public approved or approved independent school, higher education, or a home study program. Um, and then this a similar um, amendment is made in subsection B. On page three, Yeah, I'm a little just puzzled. A bill I was introduced takes us all the way back to January. Is that is that really? Yes, I'll explain. So uh, H 874 was a committee bill. It went after it was introduced by House Education. It went to a couple different committees and the House Appropriations Committee made some amendments. Right, right. I get that. The House adopted all of those amendments, and the clerk's office has not done what they need to do to get everything to the editors yeah, to buy everything. Yeah. Well, my question is, since it was introduced, there have been no edits? It was a committee bill. It was a bill. committee bill. Okay. So it so came out in form. Came out okay. Correct. Okay, that's, thank you. Can you just go back into any Vermont? So this is lowering the age yes who can participate in this program okay and so i'll just scare you all what the next section does is it repeals the high school completion program which is also a part of the flexible pathways program mm -hmm. and is for folks who are uh, who have completed at least 10th grade and are not enrolled don't have a um, high school diploma are not in college are not in um, a, a home study program so section two of the bill on page three repeals that program. That's okay. right. Uh, can I stop you? Can I stop yeah, you? please. Sorry. I, I just feel like we need a ton of backfill right now because I was on a committee over the summer and mm -hmm. fall about high school completion. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I am like very confused right now. What did the computer say? Something trying to find out, I'm trying to find where this. So, um, it was the adult ed, and it had a very long name adult ed, adult education and literacy access, uh, study, student access study committee. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we've so we have these nonprofits that do after that do adult ed, 
And so it was grappling with how to move forward with all of that. And so, okay, can you, but I don't think this is their, can... these are their suggestions. The, our committee suggestions. No, these are, this is, this, these suggestions reflect, um, I believe, suggestions from the adult ed providers. Okay. The, the AOEs, um, what the AOE wants to do, is that, was that? I don't think I can speak to that particular. I can walk you through the bill. I know, I know. <laughs> but I can't, I, I am not your gal for the genesis of these changes, right? That's pop. What am I gonna say? Those are policy decisions. Okay. I can tell you that I believe that we they took testimony from the adult ed um, program community um, in support of these changes. Whether there were other changes that were suggested in that study committee that are not represented in here, um, why that may be, I can't speak to. But I can yeah, maybe just give us just a high level overview of it. We'll have Erin in when she yep. can get back, or maybe she'll end up zooming in. So, high school completion, I'll just read you. Are you going to tell us about eight, the ages in the original program? Okay, thank you. I'm not sure. Boy, your skit idea is. <laughs> that was my thing. Uh, so the high, I'm just going to read you from the high school completion statute. So there is created a high school completion program where in the flexible pathways chapter or subsection to be a potential component of a flexible pathway for any Vermont student who is at least 16 years of age, 16, 16, who has not received a high school diploma and who may or may not work, uh, be enrolled in an approved uh, independent school. I believe the testimony that House Education heard was that the adult ed providers are also providing a lot of, if not all of the services for the high school completion program. And so what sections one and two of H874 do, if you combine them, is it gets rid of the high school completion program and it lowers the age of eligibility for the adult education and secondary credential program so that theoretically, someone who was eligible for the high school completion program is now eligible to participate in the adult diploma program. Because we've taken the age of eligibility from 20 down to 16. 16 is also kind of a magic number because it is the end of the compulsory attendance age groups. So once you hit 16, if you are not in school, you are not truant. So on your birthday, 16, yeah, 16 or 12, 16 is too late. So that's what, that's what sections one and two are doing. Right. There's also some language on page three, part of section one that is being added. And this is something you are, I am not going to be able to explain this. Uh, this is some insider baseball you are going to, I would encourage you, if you have questions about subsection D, to take testimony on this. Yeah. But there is a diagnostic portion of the adult diploma program. And there, I think there was testimony that there is a concern that that diagnostic portion is being used to exclude individuals from the program, like they're not scoring high enough in order to get into the program or stay into the program. And so subsection D is just saying the diagnostic portion of this program can be used to as a tool to evaluate educational needs or skills gained, but it cannot be used to exclude someone or to condition payment to the local providers who are providing these services. Do you want me to move on? Please, yes. just give us the whole walkthrough and then we can always... Okay. So um, there is there was a small amount of the House Appropriations made um, to Section 1, and that would be, um, if you go all the way up to page 2, line 8, their amendment removes the language at the very end of page 8, starting with which, which shall be an assessment process. So that language in the bill that you will get 
will be struck through. Section three, is an amendment to section 4011 in title 16 education payments so currently so what you see in the bill as introduced are essentially conforming amendments we changed the uh, we changed the title of the adult education secondary financial program we are reflecting that in subsection f at the very bottom of page three but there was a big substantive amendment made by House um, Appropriations. And so after, on page four, mm -hmm. at the very end of line three, after average of the previous two years, yeah. but before the period, mm -hmm. the following language will be inserted. And it's the second instance of amendment in the, in the hack amendment. 40% of the payment required under the subsection, which is the payment for students in the adult education and secondary credential program, shall be from state funds appropriated from the Ed Fund, and 60% shall be from the general fund. So currently, adult ed is funded solely through the general fund. And the high school completion program is funded through the Ed Fund. There's a repeal of the high school completion program. Mm -hmm. We are adding some eligibility uh, room to the adult ed program. Mm -hmm. And so the change that was made by the house is that now the adult education program will be funded 4060 at fund fund. There is no appropriation in this bill. There is an appropriation in the budget um, that reflects that. Page four. Dual enrollment? Yes, dual enrollment. Um, this is, if you go to page five, uh, it's more than a conforming amendment. So eligibility for dual enrollment, public school, tuition, home study, current law is page five, line one, also assigned to a public school through the high school completion program, but we just repealed high school completion program. So page five changes that to a student in the adult diploma program under subsection right. 945A. Okay. Section five. Section five, community schools. In 2021, the legislature enacted a bill, um, Act 67, that created um, community schools is a, uh, we don't have enough time to fully dig into it here, but community schools is uh, kind of a, there's a federal concept of what a community school is. And in 2021, using the COVID money, the legislature created a community schools grant program that would run for three years. It's all in session law. Yeah. So what section five does is it removes references to those three years. So you can see on page five, on line 20, mm -hmm. It just says the secretary shall provide the funding on or before September 1, period. And then there's some other conforming amendments removing the same year references. And anywhere it said like the first year or the second year, it would be the initial year or subsequent years would be the change. To, and those changes now allow for the community schools program to continue to be funded. And section six is so that we had done it as a pilot. Now they're saying they are instituting community schools as a full time. They don't take it. This bill doesn't take it out of session law, which I know for legal purposes doesn't make a bit of difference. Um, it doesn't say this, the community schools program shall be funded in perpetuity. Uh -huh. It just leaves the door open to funding. Okay. It doesn't limit it to just three years. So if there is an appropriation, and this bill carries an appropriation, okay. um, they can, con continue, they that can continue that grant project. If there is no appropriation, it's just an unfunded grant. Yep. Uh, the community schools, the Act 67 still has all of the scaffolding and structures 
um, for a school to rely on in order to be considered a community school, and they can still use that. They just wouldn't necessarily get any funding for it. Um, so section six contains the appropriation for the community schools program. It also contains some legislative intent. It is the intent of the General Assembly. Uh, and just so I know, in case this is what they've done. I mean, I've heard it sort of in the air out there that the House has attached appropriate, kept appropriate, usually we pull appropriations out, throw them to the budget, but money has traveled with a lot of their bills. Okay. I don't, I can't speak to a lot. I can only speak yeah. to the bills I've drafted. Yeah. Um, and then you saw an appropriation in the school in, construction that's bill. Right. Yeah. Um, and in this bill. Yeah. Okay. And in the both seats. Okay. And can you tell me, do you remember St. James last year if we were receiving bills without money in them in some way? No, I think we do. I still don't remember. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, so I'll just leave, in the interest of time, I'll just leave you all to the intent to, to go back over the intent section or we can go back over it. But um, basically, it's um, intent around. Um, uh, expanding learning opportunities um, and some language to kind of um, give the intent of funding the community schools program. And they put $1.9 million. In. As introduced. Okay. If you go over to the third instance of amendment, yeah. it's taken down to $1 million. Okay. Um, section 7. There's kind of two things happening here. One, this is the section seven, I'm on page 11, line seven, Flexible Pathways Initiative. This is the um, kind of main language for the Flexible Pathways Initiative. Um, there are, um, let's see, there are some conforming amendments on page 13 because we've gotten rid of the high school completion program um, and we've renamed the Adult Education and Secondary Prevention Program on lines eight through 11. Mm -hmm. But this bill also is the section I was talking about yesterday. This section is the section I was talking about yesterday that goes with section eight, the VSAC section that we walked through yesterday. Right. So part of this statute, part of the Flexible Pathways Initiative requires, and I'm gonna ask you to look back up to page 11, line 17. Yeah. Uh, same deal, go ahead. Does the Flexible Pathways Initiative not already exist? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, so, it so. is. Okay, why is it saying there is created within the agency a flexible? That's, it. That's all current law. Thank you. Um, uh, so, um, if you go to line 17 on page 11, the secretary shall develop, publish, and regularly update guidance in the form of technical assistance, sharing of best practices and model documents, legal interpretations, and other support designed to assist school districts. Now there's a whole list of things. If you um, go to page 12, line four, that guidance has to be designed to assist school districts to work with every student in grades seven through 12 in an ongoing personalized learning planning, planning process that and if you skip to line 11, mm -hmm. this is the new language. Identifies career and post-secondary planning options using resources provided pursuant to subdivision four of this subsection B. So let's go to four, okay. which is on page 13, line 13. Remember, yep. AOE is developing guidance that will assist school districts to Provide students beginning not later than grade seven with career development post secondary planning resources. Line 17 is the new language. These resources provided pursuant to the subdivision have to include information regarding the admissions process and requirements necessary to proceed with any and all military related opportunities. Okay. Please, Senator Duo. That's helpful. Actually, Senator. Oh, sir. Just a Maybe a question, maybe a comment about the language here. Uh, I'm looking at nine, line 19 and with any and all military related opportunities, I'm wondering if instead of any and all, it should be with relevant military related opportunities. I'm, I'm thinking of a kid if you know, they want to become a nuclear scientist, you know, what do they, should they 
they need to be hearing about opportunities regarding becoming an x-ray tech in the Navy or a pilot in the Air Force. Um, but yeah, I, I think it could make sense if they hear about opportunities to work on a nuclear sub and get those details. But any and all related military opportunities just seems like a whole lot of information that they're required to put on a student much of which might not be relevant to what their aspirations are. So yeah, I guess that's just coming. I, I've noted it. Seems strikes me as a policy decision, but if you're wrong. We're on the same page. <laughs> page 14, section eight, we walked through yesterday. This dovetails with the section we just sorry, I didn't get to ask that question. Okay. Um <laughs> if we're gonna do military things um why aren't we also including for example like americorps which is also a government service that also provides like post-secondary opportunities policy oh. the language before that and um, the the new language was um uh in our so the current law already requires them to offer information um, that would ensure students take full advantage of opportunities available within flexible pathways to achieve their career and post-secondary education training goals so uh, policy policy decision okay this was that language um in section a was part of a standalone bill that was incorporated into this right oh yeah we did get to the second um, section eight, planning resources. This goes with section seven that we just talked about. It requires VSAC to also include all military related options in any um, post secondary planning or financial aid uh, planning resources it produces. Okay. Section nine is some intent language saying that it's the intent of the General Assembly to continue to review flexible pathways to make sure it's working. Section 10. Um, Oops, let's go. Sorry, I, sh I missed a I missed an amendment. If you go back up to the community schools report, mm -hmm. the House Appropriations Committee also added um, a new section to be Section Five A. So to come after the community school section and before the appropriation. It requires AOE to report back certain information about the community schools program. Um, and that information is, it's on page two, line seven, it's the fifth instance of amendment. Do, does the community school structure support schools in more efficient implementation of the education quality standards? And does the community school structure improve access to and efficiency in the provision of mental health services, social support services, and health services? There's already a report due to the legislature at the end of this year. And so this um, language would require this information to be added to that report. Uh, okay, so we're gonna jump to page or, um, section 10, line uh, page 14. Career settlement figures of post-secondary graduates. This should look familiar to you. You have a, actually, do you have a companion bill? This was an agency um, request. No. I can't remember if we walked through this. Okay. So, um, on or before July 1, 2025, AOE, um, Commerce and Community Development and Labor, in consultation with Vermont's public and private post-secondary education institutions, shall issue a written report to you all on the post-graduation career and settlement behaviors of students attending Vermont colleges and universities. You would have took that last year. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, and the, at a minimum, the report has to include an analysis of and discussion of why Vermont is last in the country and percentage of college students who stay in the same state in which the school they graduated from is located. Information on the types of degrees most commonly attained at Vermont-based post-secondary schools. Um, a discussion of the obstacles preventing graduates from staying in Vermont, including whether housing options factor in. Comprehensive plan to increase the percentage of Vermont graduates who plan to live and work in Vermont for at least five years after graduation. Mm -hmm. um, and that plan needs to include the following initiatives. Better career college pipelines between higher ed and employers. 
expanding career counseling and career development services on campuses focused on Vermont industries and companies, increased campus community ties through service, cultural exchanges, and other community initiatives, and incentives including preferential or streamlined pathways to licensure for graduates. Uh, and then A, we will provide the support for this report. The sixth instance of amendment on page two, line 13, adds a, some new requirements to this reporting requirement related to flexible pathways initiative. It requires the report to include, um, and this is where that standalone um, standalone amendment comes into play. It requires schools to include broken down by significant demographic the following information. The information on participation rates by flexible pathways initiative program type. Um, so instead of just subdivision one being broken down by significant demographic group, Rep. Branning's amendment makes all of these a requirement to be broken down by a significant demographic group. Student performance measured by completion rates um, by high school of origin, uh, dual enrollment and early college coursework, post-secondary enrollment rates for students participating in dual enrollment in early college as compared to non-participating students, post-secondary retention rates for a period of at least one academic year and persistence rates for students participating in dual enrollment in early college as compared to non-participating students, and post high school continuation into the workforce for students participating in dual enrollment in early college as compared to non participating students. Yeah, please. Can we point out this is a question for yeah. the, our committee? How many reports the AOE is currently working on, and also like what kind of capacity they have to do all this reporting? I, I just see yeah. a lot. This Morgan, Morgan, did you hear that? Sorry, I did not hear that last part. Uh, would you have Secretary Boucher in next week to talk about uh, the reports that still might be outstanding, updating us on uh, their capacity to do other reports? Thank you. John. Absolutely. Report. Yeah, but we should hear, I think, what their situation is over there right now. On their webpage are completed reports. Like how many? Well, you have our website. Reports are due to the committee. Yes, you can find that information. It's not always accurate, and it is hard to kind of compare what you have versus what you don't. And they may, the reports may not just be coming from our committee either. Right? They could be coming from the committee. Yeah. Section 11 is the last section of section. Well, there's one more. Um, page 16. Section 11, we're adding a section to Title 16 in the school and the supervisor union chapter um, regarding the uniform chart of accounts. This language is taken right out of session law. So currently, if you skip to section 12, page 17, starting in 2014, Action Resolves number 179, you can see it was the budget that year. Um, there was a requirement that all supervisory unions use the uniform chart of accounts to record and report all school finance data. That requirement has not changed, but it lives in session law and not even just session law, it lives buried in a budget, a couple different budgets. So this, all this section does is take that language out of session law, plunks it into the green books so everyone can find it easily, and then we repeal the session law so we're not duplicating efforts. Uh, and then the effective date is July 1, 2024. Rep Radio will come in next week, give us some more information. This is the final bill in the House, correct? PCBs, construction, OCs, miscellaneous ed. Yes. Okay. This seems to me to be the biggest bit, frankly, of them. And I'm a little surprised. I thought the others would be bigger of this, but this is going to be bigger. We have things that will attach to it. Yes, Senator Blair. So, and uh, we're going to add something to this too, right? Not to multiple things, probably. Yeah, a couple things to the others. I think we should send our schools. We had language in our miscellaneous ed bill that I don't want to have disappear. I don't think they would take it out, but um, 
the five hundred thousand versus the two million. Uh, the public bids. Yeah, the public bids. We might just put that at the school construction bill also. Um, okay. Anything immediately pressing on these? Yeah. So I know. I just feel like I have to read this over the weekend because it seems really. And I think Rep. Brady, Brady will be. Yeah. I thought we'd wait and have Rep. Brady and Matt will be. Yeah. And we'll have the, the edited version so everything will yes. be in one. But this gives everybody an idea and it helps me recognize there's, there's a lot more in there than I thought they put in there, which is exciting. St. James, have a safe drive. Thank you. Thanks, a trip back. Thanks, everybody. We're adjourned.